First of all, I'd just like to say how excited I am to be here. Um, some of you might be wondering, why is an artist presenting at a scientific workshop? But as Sherry indicated in some of her opening remarks, art can be a very powerful tool to engage students in e exposing them and engaging them in scientific inquiry and content. Um, so what I'm going to do today is kind of run through this program that we've been developing, uh, codifying this concept of incorporating the elements of art as a tool to analyze planetary images. I'm going to do a more condensed version of it since we're short on time. And then you guys will be given tools so that you can take these types of concepts back into your classroom. But briefly, just to give you a little idea of who I am, this is my day job. And I make very large paintings inspired by the geomorphology of the planets and moons in the solar system. And this is an image of my husband whose work is inspired by biology, chemistry, mathematics, astrobiology. Kind of a, a specific example, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see an image of a crater called Celix on the icy moon Europa, one of Jupiter's wonderful Galilean satellites. And on the left side, you see a painting inspired by that feature made of yarn, acrylic, paper, fiber. And this is essentially what we're going to be doing today in kind of a smaller format. We're going to be making pastel drawings inspired by planetary surfaces. Another example, here's another large moon of Jupiter, Ganymede. Largest moon in the solar system. It's actually larger than Mercury. Many of you may know this. And here are some art pieces inspired by that moon. The painting um, is about five feet by 10 feet, to, just to give you an idea of scale. And the steel sphere, planetary insp inspired sphere in the background is about five feet in diameter. And this image was at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So through this amazing career that we have had working with the NASA and scientific community, we have discovered so much. And one of the main things we've discovered is that the artists and scientists, especially planetary scientists, actually share a lot of things in common. And through that process, we also got very passionate about education, using art as a mechanism to introduce children to science and engineering. Here we are doing some really cool mixed media planetary inspired paintings with children in Jackson Hole. And this summer, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with McCrell um, at a workshop in Denver where we really started honing in kind of our ideas and started to develop the program that we'll be introducing to you guys today. And in this program, and we're still trying to iron out some of the details, but you guys will get a toolkit today that will help you in taking this back to your classroom curriculum. But there will be an extensive PowerPoint lecture, a condensed version of which I'm presenting today. And in that PowerPoint lecture, there will be a notes section that out actually has kind of script type notes so that you can use it in the classroom, as well as scientific notes if you want to delve into further investigation. Um, we've also really wanted to correlate the images we're using um, to correlate to the discovery mission projects as well as other recent uh, and current missions of NASA to help engage kids and excite them about solar system exploration. Um, the main thing about this program, which I think is, is quite interesting, is that it is very scalable to all different age groups. Even though you're making art and it's, it's kind of this simple approach, it's something that seems to resonate. And different iterations of this program has been taught from kindergarten students to college age students, all the way up to adult continuing education in museum contexts. We'll also be doing the actual art activity here today. At the workshop, you'll see there's some materials that have already been passed out, and we'll give you some more. We'll go through that at the end of the presentation. Uh, we have beautiful NASA image prints, which personally I find are the most exciting part of this project, is when you expose children or even older students to these images, they're just really captivated by them. They really speak for themselves. Um, this program can be taught one day, two day. It's very flexible in terms of the time frame. And it will ultimately have a more in-depth teacher training guide. 
And what I also really think is fun about this is it, it's so interdisciplinary. It can be taught in science classrooms. We've taught it in art classrooms. We've had art and science departments working together. It can be in general education. So it's very flexible. And uh, it's been done at schools, universities, museums, science museums, art museums. So again, trying to get this flexible curriculum for you guys so that you can tailor it and use it within your particular classroom situation. So to start with, I think it's always a really good idea to kind of assess where your students are and talk about what you know about the solar system. Um, there are more extensive script notes about how you can use this in your particular environment, but briefly, talking about the, the inner planets, the terrestrial planets, the outer planets, gas giants, um, and really trying to get a, an assessment of, of where your particular students are in their knowledge. Um, a very important point it, to make is that this project is talking about visible surface geology. So we won't really be addressing the surfaces of the gas giants. However, these planets have fascinating and marvelous moons that are the, the target of a lot of current research and missions. So we will be spending a lot of time talking about the moons, particularly of the outer solar system. Um, we will also be focusing on small bodies, like the giant asteroid Vesta. And I find that most students are not very familiar with these worlds, and they get pretty excited about these images. So when we want to study something, um, it's not very easy to go there ourselves, obviously, right? So we sent out these amazing robotic explorers, and I like to think of them as robotic photographers. They're returning images, remote sensing, sensing images to us that we have to analyze, decipher, and interpret. Here's an amazing image of the giant asteroid Vesta. And when I look at that, I think, wow, that looks like a painting or an abstract piece of art. And people aren't always aware that art's not just this loosey-goosey thing, that art is actually grounded in theory and foundation. And the thing that artists use to analyze visual information are something called the elements of art. Line, shape, color, value, texture. And these elements can be very valuable tools in analyzing images of planetary surfaces. For instance, when a scientist see a circle on an image, generally that means there's been an impact and it's left a crater. It's an impact feature. Again, a very basic concept, but something that is very powerful for, ch for children, students to start really understanding what their eyes are looking at. And of course, if you want to see circles and impact features, one of the most fascinating worlds to visit is Mercury. And the messenger mission has taken these amazing images of the surface. And when we get down to the surface, we see all different types of circles. We see very regular circles. We see kind of eroded, subtle circles. We see big ones. We see small ones. And all these different types of circles can tell us a lot about the history of the, the surface of Mercury. Um, we also see different types of shapes of ejecta blanket from Venus on the left-hand side to the ray crater on Ganymede's surface. The size and shapes of the ejecta and the impact features can tell us so much about a planetary body. Also, counting craters is a very important tool that scientists use to determine the age of a planetary surface. We have Mercury, or, wait, what do we have? Is that Mercury? Moon. Ah, what it says up there. We have Moon on the uh, right side, lots and lots of circles. We have Mer Mars on the left side, has a much smoother texture. So that's going to tell us something about the history of those two surfaces. And in teaching this curriculum, these are wonderful opportunities to ask students, well, what do you think it tells us? Why do you think that is? And let them start to engage in the process of inquiry themselves. Here we have the giant asteroid Vesta. And we often think, oh, asteroids could be something that hit a planetary body. But guess what? They've been hit a lot, too. And they have circles and impact features as well. And of course, with any rule, there are going to be exceptions. So we see these circles on the surface of Venus, and we think, OK, were those impact features? But actually, they're not. They're volcanic features called pancake domes. 
Okay, so let's go on to uh, irregular shapes, organic shapes, or what I like to call simply blobs because it's a lot easier to remember. When scientists see blobs on the surface of a planetary body, it generally makes, means they're looking at a volcanic process. I have lakes in parentheses over there, which we'll get to in just a second. So we're here we have Olympus Mons on the surface of Mars, humongo volcano with this blobby shape. And of course, if we want to look for blobs in our solar system, we go to Jupiter's moon Io. And all these little irregular blobby shapes on the surface are volcanoes. Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And it's also just incredibly beautiful with the color, and I find that images of Io really speak to students. Here we have a close-up of the Ionian surface, and we have all these blobby irregular shapes from various flows. Another great place to look for blobs, our volcanic activity in the solar system is the surface of Venus. And sometimes we learn things that really kind of recraft, reshape our interpretation. Here we have Saturn's large moon Titan, which the Cassini mission has been exploring. And Titan, when you look down on the surface of Titan, these are false color images, they're not true color, we see all these blobby shapes. But these blobs are not volcanoes. Instead, we've discovered that Titan has something very similar to the hydrological system on Earth. However, these are lakes of methane. Okay, let's go to line now. When we see straight lines on a planetary image, generally that means that we are looking at some sort of tectonic activity. Cracks, faulting, ridges, mountain building. This is an image of Europa. Lots and lots of straight lines on Europa. Here's another image of Europa. It's covered in an ice shell. There's a lot of tidal forces. It leaves the surface riddled with tectonic activity. There's indications that there is a uh, global ocean beneath the ice surface. It's fun to ask students, what does this remind you of? You know, what does this kind of look like on Earth? And some of them will get to the point that they're thinking Antarctica, ice shelves, icebergs. Okay, if we see squiggly lines on the surface of a planetary body, generally it means we're looking at erosional forces, either wind or liquid. I say liquid because we now have evidence that there's not just water on planetary surfaces, but in the case of Mars, there is methane. Here's an image of Mars. We like Mars a lot. We see lots of squiggly lines, lots of evidence that there has been water there uh, in the recent past. This is an amazing image. Now, this is showing dunes, sand dunes on Mars, looking at those squiggly lines. And of course, Earth is a wonderful place to look at squiggly lines because Earth is the only planetary body known to have liquid water on the surface. And I think it's really important in teaching this type of curriculum to have a comparative planetology approach. And we're show, you're showing amazing images of other worlds, but also taking that back to Earth to reinforce to students that you do live on a planet. And we have amazing remote sensing images of the Earth's surface, Oop, like that one. On to color. Um, color is a really fascinating concept in science, I think, especially as an artist, because scientists image worlds not just in invisible light, what our eyes see, but they use all sorts of different tools, from infrared, ultraviolet, different filters, um, to really study and get better assessments of what's happening on a planetary surface. I think it's something that it also excites students to see that things are not just in black and white, but look what color does. Look what you can see once you enhance images with color. It gives you all sorts of new information. Value um, is the contrast between light and dark. This is the one element of art that some students may not be familiar with as much. There's a, obviously a corollary in science, albedo. And if you want to start it, study contrast, the best place in the solar system to look is Iapetus, a wonderful icy moon of Saturn. 
One side is bright white, the other side is dark as velvet. It's called the yin yang moon. Kids really tend to like this moon. Another wonderful world is Enceladus, which is bright, bright, bright. It's the brightest object in the solar system other, other than the sun. And this goes into questions like, well, why is it bright? What's bright? Well, it's a great opportunity to talk about ice. And again, there's more of these types of prompts and notes within the program. And on this image, I'd like to point out, you can start to build the elements of art to understand more complex stories. For instance, what do you see at the top? You see a lot of circles. Well, what do you see at the bottom? You don't see as many circles. You see lines. What can that tell you? Well, those lines at the bottom are tectonic features, tiger stripes, from which geysers, water geysers, are emanating. There's a lot of geo geologic activity happening down there. It's erased any impact feature that might have been there prior. So you can start having students combine these things to tell stories. Texture, quality of a surface. Textures are obviously fascinating to look at on worlds. They're evidence of years, eons and eons of different geologic processes happening. Um, this is Triton again, and Ralph talked about it, but it has this crazy texture. I like to ask students, what does it remind you of in terms of like if you thought fruit? And many of them will be like cantaloupe, and indeed it's called cantaloupe terrain. And all those little blobby black shapes, what do we learn about blobs? Probably volcanic in nature. Indeed, they think that the blobby black shapes uh, correlate to cryovolcanism. Another crazy world to look at in terms of texture is Miranda. And all these straight line features are indicative of crazy tectonic activity. Indeed, scientists think that Miranda was probably impacted, blown apart, Oops, <laughs> dropping things up here and came back together. And here's Hyperion. What does it look like? I like to ask students, like a loofah. Yeah, it does look like a loofah. Why isn't it round? It's a great question to ask kids. Why isn't it round? Why is it all lumpy bumpy? Well, then that can engage kids into more of a conversation about mass and planetary formation. And like I said, once you uh, start to look at these elements of art, you can combine them to start crafting and understanding the geologic histories of planetary surfaces. Here we have a very recent mosaic of the surface of Mercury on which we see Circles, we see big circles, we see little circles, we see fresh circles, we see ray craters, so we can start to really understand the impact history. We also see a blobby shape. Um, where is that pointer? Here. We see this blobby shape right here, which is a, probably a, an old volcanic basin. We see some straight lines that are tectonic in nature, probably scarps or cliffs. And we have a poster back here that you guys can all get this that actually has a key to interpreting this. But the point I want to make is that after kids start to understand the elements of art, they can start building things. They can put them together and understand layers and stories and geologic histories of planetary bodies. And just to conclude, the thing that really inspires both artists and scientists is what we don't know. You know, those big questions that Sherry had up at the beginning. Like this image of Mercury, we see this little chain of circles here, this little chain of circles here. How in the world did that happen? And we don't, we don't actually know. We think that something probably was in orbit, broke up, left a stream of craters. But why are they at perpendicular angles? So that that process of inquiry and investigation is what really propels science. It can also very much propel students. And using art as a tool to help guide them in that process can really inspire them and get them excited about learning more and delving further into the scientific content that you're trying to get implemented in your classroom.